What's going on everyone? Today, we're gonna take a look at all the important features in Lords of the Fallen. Mechanics you're gonna need to take advantage of, how to correctly upgrade, and overall, how to go about completing this game. This is the ultimate beginner's guide to Lords of the Fallen. Starting out, you need to understand the importance of choosing the correct class. This should be relatively familiar if you've played a Souls game, as there are 10 starting classes to choose from, each granting different loot and stat distributions. The first six are basic classes with the last four being advanced. Advanced classes are not necessarily more difficult to play, it's just that their stats are much more tightly distributed. Orion Preacher, for example, is probably the most powerful starting class as it's got most of the stats in health and radiance, versus something like the Partisan, which could go in any direction. Strength is your big heavy hitting weapons, agility is going to be your dex or light fast weapons, endurance is stamina and vitality is health, radiance is going to be your whole Holy type of magic and inferno is your fire magic endurance doesn't really need to be upgraded past level 20 or 25 for the entire game if you don't want to so you can dump most of your stats into health and whatever damage stat you chose in my opinion the best two classes for your first playthrough are dark crusader if you have it or the orion preacher as far as combat mechanics go, you have several items at your disposal. Your main weapon has two different stances, one being the one-handed and the other being two-handed. Dual wielding two different weapons is also an option, but be aware dual wielding is more for applying statuses quickly with faster weapons. Whereas heavier attacks will be more beneficial for when you're two-handing your main weapon. Shields are also an option as well, but unfortunately you can't get a shield to block 100% damage, at least for the first half of the game. Blocking will deal great damage to your health, which can be gained back if you attack. Blocking can be beneficial as enemies will bounce back after hitting your shield. Just be aware you need to be aggressive or risk losing all your health to blocking. Now your health and endurance are at the top left. All actions cost stamina such as attacking, dodging, or casting magic. Stamina is pretty well balanced here to where you won't need to level into it a lot, but you do need enough to perform all your actions. Under your stamina bar, you have your projectile count. Now magic classes get a mana bar instead, which will be used up by any talisman. Non-magic casters instead get throwing items or a bow or crossbow. The harder hitting your throwing item is, the more it costs to use. For example, a basic throwing knife costs one bar to use, whereas gourds filled with explosive powder are going to cost three or four bars. Most throwing items feel better used to aggro enemies or hit down items. Crossbows, bows, and magic on the other hand can be very effective at damage for long range. In the bottom left, you have a hot bar of items, and the most important being the healing item. This can be upgraded to increase its healing and amount at the main hub with this lady here. You'll find healing upgrades while exploring the game, but be aware, most are very easy to miss. So exploring is key to not miss any important loot. Other than that, you're going to have infusions to imbue your weapon with fire, poison, wither, or other stuff as well. These again are going to be great for damage, but the statuses tied to them are more easily procced with a faster weapon. There will be rocks you find that heal over time or grant mana back. Highly beneficial for magic users and the health isn't super important if you're playing in co-op, but solo you may want to use those rocks pretty often. You can find items that are called Vigor Skulls. These grant you Vigor for stat upgrades, which is a confusing name since other games use Vigor for health, so we're going to call them Souls exclusively on this channel because it's just easier that way. Finally, you have the bottom right of your screen. Here you can switch between your projectile and your lantern. Now the projectile, I already explained, but be aware you can switch out for many different projectile types depending on your stats. As for the lantern, this is a very important mechanic you need to get the hang of as soon as possible. Pulling this out will let you see the second nether-like dimension. Use this to find bridges that only exist in that dimension, granting access to secret loot or just the next area. You can use this lantern to suck out the soul of enemies as well. This is on a charge, and at the start of the game you get only one charge at a time, seen by the blue orb under your health and stamina. This soul-like pull ability will stun enemies for several seconds, granting you time to deal damage or recover. If you attack the souls instead of the enemy itself, you'll deal wither damage. Withered enemies take white damage to their health, and when hit, they take much more damage as a result. Or you can simply pull the souls out over an edge for enemies to fall off. You can control the direction of the souls with your right joystick and in some cases attack the souls and an enemy at the same time, which is really good for some seriously high damage. And this mechanic also works on humanoid bosses, which can absolutely trivialize those fights if you get more lantern charges. 
To get these blue orb charges back, you can absorb soul energy from balls in the nether dimension, or most enemies also have some soul energy on them as well. Some enemies will also be shielded by a nether entity, which requires you to use this soul absorption ability to break the shield. Almost every single boss has a soul mechanic, so be sure to check this as soon as you enter the arena. Lastly, you have the ability to enter the nether dimension completely. This opens up the entire dark world for you to explore new sections of the map or uncover areas that weren't available before. Sometimes entire areas can be hidden underwater or in a back cave, so you'll need to do this often. Problem is, you die in the nether and you're dead for good, because if you die normally, you'll be revived into the nether world. And while in the nether, an eye timer will count down in the top right of your screen. Spend too much time there and challenging enemies will spawn in to usually insta-kill you. This timer is extremely lenient, so most of the time, don't be afraid to explore in that realm. And use the weird face objects you find to re-enter the normal world, which resets the timer. To summarize, you'll use the lantern to enter the normal and nether dimension throughout the game, exploring different areas and providing platforms to traverse areas. Just be careful because when your lantern is out, you can be hit by enemies in the nether realm. There are also several other non-combat related mechanics you should be aware of. Vestiges are your main checkpoints throughout the game. These are where you upgrade, teleport to other areas, and rest to regain all your heals. In the early game, you'll have these pretty commonly as the areas are smaller. Later on, there will only be one or two in a huge area. This limits the teleport points so there aren't a thousand spots to scroll through when teleporting. This also means that some areas will be very hard to re-explore or go back to, so be sure to explore as much as possible when you're in the area for the first time. Now, there are also secondary checkpoints that you can create yourself. These will require vestige seeds and can be placed on what look like flower beds. These are extremely important and you can only ever have one active at any time. So each time you plant a new temporary checkpoint, it gets rid of the last one you planted. These flower beds are spread all across the game and often show up right after or before a difficult section of combat. I'd highly recommend you place a checkpoint at every single one of these so you don't complete entire sections just to die and be sent all the way back to the very beginning of a large area. I will warn you, however, that towards the middle section of the game, these start popping up all over the place and using one on every single flower bed will run you out of vested seeds quickly. So as you get further into the game, don't be afraid to skip one or two if it's like two minutes from the main checkpoint. It's also worth noting that in umbral areas or in the nether realm, you will find corpses that require you to soul tether out an item. These are extremely important as they hold valuable loot like weapons, healing upgrades, and other slottables. There are chests to loot as well, but the corpses are much more common than chests and should not be ignored. Another significant world mechanic are the memories. These show up as a red lantern or blue butterflies. If you run across a red lantern on the ground, this means another online player has been defeated by an enemy. Soul suck this lantern and it will lead you to that enemy. This will upgrade the enemy with more damage and health, but you get some eyes if you beat them. As far as I know, these eyes can be used to purchase color palettes for armor. The blue butterflies, on the other hand, signify memories. You're gonna need to enter the nether realm and use the soul ability on them. This will play out a bit of lore, usually on an NPC in the area or someone of note you can learn about. Most are very lorified, and what I mean by that is they're pretty darn confusing and told cryptically. So don't be put off if you don't really learn anything from any of these and they just confuse you. You're gonna wanna do all these because they grant umbral scouring, or as I like to call them, blue shrimps. These blue shrimps can be used to purchase boss items, meaning you want as much as you can get. And lastly, these memories show up after every single significant boss fight. So after beating a boss, make sure you go umbral and enter the netherworld and soul siphon the memory there. These boss ones will grant things called remembrances, which lets you purchase boss loot. You can turn in these remembrances at an NPC in the main hub, which I'll go over next. Now, all your upgrades for weapons, imbues for damage, and extra stuff can be bought from merchants. Most are at the main hub area, although not right away. The main one you're going to care about is the blacksmith. She's accessible after you explore the second area of the game, right before the giant red fleshy boss. So if you didn't find her before that, go back and look around a bit. Without her, you are completely screwed. 
Once freed, she will be at the main hub and can upgrade your weapons with stones you'll find. The more upgraded your weapon gets, the better it scales with your stats and you deal more damage. Later on in the game, you can give her an item which allows gems to be slotted onto your weapons. Some simply increase scaling, while others provide effects such as health back from defeated enemies. So you can customize your weapons a bit to make them better at dual wielding or simply deal more damage. You also have another extremely important merchant at the main hub, I think is named Molehew. You need to enter the Umbral Dimension to talk to him and he deals with your lantern. Now the most important feature here is the socketing Umbral Eyes. This lets you place found eye items into your lantern for more effects, the best one being found early on that grants an additional lantern charge. Later on, this lantern will be able to hold more than one eye at a time, granting some cool upgrades while you're in the nether or just in general. You can also offer up remembrances with this NPC. This has you purchase boss items with those blue shrimps, and some of the items are extremely useful like really good spells for magic users or much better armor, even granting powerful weapons at times. Check this after every major boss. You can also upgrade the charges of your lamp with this NPC, although as far as I know, the early game doesn't have very many of these. As far as other NPCs, you have the Lady by the Vestige to improve your healing items, there's a more holy type merchant for your radiance items, and the Inferno merchant is in the prison back inside the temple itself. You'll need to look around in that area and bring her some items, so you might want to look that up if you're looking into Inferno. Now, it's pretty important to know how stats scale and how statuses work as well. Stats will have soft and hard caps like in most Souls likes, and you need to know where they're at. Soft caps to me don't really matter at all because in reality, you're going to push past them until you reach the hard cap, which is where stats stop mattering much. From the information I found, the hard cap for any damage stat is 75, so Strength, Agility, Radiance, and Inferno can stop being increased once you reach 75, which is pretty high, honestly. Hard caps for Health and Stamina are at 60, which ultimately means level your health to 60, get your damage stat to 75, then invest more in Stamina, or go into another damage type. Pretty standard stuff, honestly. As for statuses, there are quite a few in this game, and I have a bit of experience with most of them. You have Bleed, Burn, Frostbite, Ignite, Poison, Smite, and Wither. Bleed builds up a status that eventually deals a chunk of physical damage, then making enemies weaker to physical damage. Burn builds up a status that deals fire damage over time. Frostbite builds up a status that will deal a chunk of enemy health when fully procced. Ignite essentially builds up an explosion that makes enemies weaker to fire for a time. Poison is going to build up to then deal damage over time once procced. Smite causes holy damage once built up, making enemies take more damage to holy. Lastly, you have Wither, which deals gray health to your enemies. It can build up to deal a finisher on enemies or take larger chunks of their health away. Now, from my personal experience, Wither is extremely powerful. Poison is much better than it's ever been in these types of games, dealing really good damage to enemies over time. Every single one of the human-type enemies can be trivialized with poison, while several larger bosses are resistant or immune to it. Bleed isn't very good early on, although probably good once you find a weapon with more bleed potential. Frost is excellent, Smite is very good, and Burn's good as well, but large sections of the game have enemies resistant to fire. In the end, they don't seem completely broken, but very good at procking damage over time effects or a boost to your damage overall. Ultimately, your goal is to go from one area to the next, exploring for loot and gaining souls to upgrade with, leading to a boss that is either a midway boss that's less difficult or an end of an area boss, which is your ultimate challenge. You can select from a variety of weapons, and if you want to play it safe, some of the classes start with very good options that you can use throughout the entire game. Be on the lookout for amulets, as you can equip one at any given time, which can buff damage overall, or provide increases to statuses and ranged abilities. You also get two rings, which provide more health, resistance to statuses, or improvements to stats. Armor is more easy to manage with light, medium, and heavy dodges. Heavy being kinda hard to reach, even with some really good armor sets, so find a nice set that keeps you in medium range for the best experience. Lastly, you have the dodging, which when not locked on, you do a long roll, and when locked on, you're gonna sidestep. Double tap to long roll when locked on. The long roll is much more lenient, while the sidestep is more precise, making it sometimes better to not lock on if you're bad at a particular boss's moveset. And I don't really think there's much else you guys need to know. Anything I left out you can probably figure out as you go and won't really affect the game that much. This guide should give you an extremely good start to the game with a decent handle of the mechanics and where you can upgrade. 
This game is actually really solid and there's a lot of stuff to mess with. I will warn you, however, this is not a Souls game. It feels pretty different and don't go into it expecting it to feel like Souls or Elden Ring. Magic in particular is very cool with the Molehue Merchant having an excellent low stat requirement for powerful magic. Also, some of the magic imbue abilities to buff your weapons last ages, making them ridiculously good if you're wanting to gain a leg up on some of the enemies. Do be careful as the game is very challenging at times, but upgrade as you go and exploit the lantern mechanics and you should be fine. Hopefully this helped you out, and if it did, a like down below would be fantastic. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.